Welcome to Union. Uh, Union is wherever you are. So wherever your home is on this Sunday, there is sanctuary in this place. And we say to one and to all, welcome to Union. At Union, you are family. You are invited to move as the Holy Spirit directs. Uh, today is a wonderful Sunday. It's a wonderful Sunday to be alive. It's a wonderful Sunday uh, to be at Union, to be uh, in church. We've got a lot to celebrate, a lot to do. Uh, we come to uh, the end of the appointment year, uh, which in the United Methodist Church is basically the end of like our fiscal year. Um, appointments of pastors go in the United Methodist Church go from July 1 to June 30th. Uh, so uh, today for many churches um, is the last Sunday uh, for their pastor to be appointed as they go off into other uh, mission fields uh, as July 1 begins the tenure of a new pastor. Excited today uh, that uh, today is the last Sunday that Reverend Kyle will be with us under, not under appointment. Next Sunday, he begins with us as the appointed pastor for strategic engagement. So go ahead and put your hands together and bless God uh, for Reverend uh, Kyle. We're excited about this new season that begins. He'll actually be preaching next Sunday as a marker of uh, this wonderful time. We also celebrate uh, that uh, on next Sunday, Reverend Dr. Adama and Reverend Ashley uh, begin their second year under appointment uh, here and I begin my third. Uh, so we mark this time because it's important to take time uh, to acknowledge important things that happen in our uh, life. And uh, as Reverend Kyle will pray, we will lift up uh, the churches and congregations in our conference, in our connection, that are um, saying farewell to pastors as the pastors take leave and as they begin a time of new uh, beginnings. Because we're at the end of the appointment year, I'm going to take an opportunity in the sermon uh, to preach from the year of inspiration reimagined as we kind of look back over all that God has done uh, for us in 2021 thus far, as we look forward to all that God is going to do for the remainder of the year. And we've got a wonderful renovation video update for you. So definitely stay around, uh, stay around uh, after the offering. We'll have that renovation update because I know many of you are anxious to get back in the building. Amen. Can I get an amen? Uh, we're, 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 we're wanting to uh, hug one another. Uh, so the, the video is going to give you a sense of where we are in that journey uh, as we make plans for re-entry into uh, the building. Uh, so beloved, if it's your first time here at Union, I would be remiss if I didn't extend a very warm, warm welcome uh, to you. Again, at Union, you are family. We invite you to, uh, you can click the link. Reverend Kyle just placed it in the chat. You can fill out a connect card. Everyone, you can check out the unionboston.org forward slash online to get a copy of the bulletin, or you can download it on uh, your app. Uh, we are indeed then, as we enter into worship and we turn to the Holy One in prayer, we are excited. Uh, we are delighted that you are here and uh, we call ourselves to worship this day uh, in spirit and in truth. Reverend Kyle. Yeah, thanks, Pastor Jay. Um, beloved, good morning. Uh, yeah, as Pastor Jay said, I'm Reverend Kyle, my last Sunday as minister, and can't wait to be appointed next week as pastor of strategic engagement here. If you'll please uh, pray with me as we enter into worship this day. Holy and loving God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who we are for us to get together in this place on Zoom. We thank you for this community, for a place where we can be our full selves and to be known by you and to know that we are truly beloved of you and of one another. God, we lift up in this time, difficult emotions, our grief over the many losses, the isolation, the continued hurt and grief of this last year and a half of the pandemic. And with more acute tragedies like what happened in Surfside, we feel afraid. And we feel grief. 
We pray for those victims and their families of the condo that fell down in Surfside, and we pray that you give them comfort and peace in this horrendous tragedy. And God, we pray for all those churches uh, that are experiencing transition in the next week, um, for new pastors, for pastors that are moving around, give them strength and courage in their new appointments and uh, help these new congregations to welcome them. May they welcome each other in their ministries. And uh, God, we know that this process of moving is a beautiful gift of your church, though it may be difficult. Um, we thank you for the ways that this can help re-enliven your church and its ministries and truly help us in our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. God, in all these difficulties, we praise you because you are with us. We praise you because you make a way out of no way. We thank you and praise you because you wake us up every day. You set us on our way and you give us your spirit. So Lord, we pray that your spirit move powerfully in this place this morning, that we may truly be changed. And God, that someone here that needs it may experience healing, they may experience awakening, they may experience new breath and new life this day. Because God, you know that we need it. We desperately need it. So God, we praise you this day and we love you. We pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
love it as we come to the time in the service where we turn to the scripture. I want to invite Robert and Ruby and Crystal to offer the reading of God's word today. Thank you, Pastor Jay. As we gather on this fourth Sunday of June, about midway through 2021, we celebrate all that has happened in our midst with anticipation of all that is before us. So hear these words of scripture that offer a foundation for 2021, the anchor text of the year of inspiration at Union, a reading from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of St. John in the second chapter of Acts. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Then Simon Peter arrived and entered the tomb. He observed the linen wrappings on the ground. and saw the piece of cloth that had covered Jesus's head, lying not with the wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the disciple who had arrived first at the tomb went in. He saw and believed. As yet, they didn't understand the scripture that Jesus was to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. In the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked in the room where the disciples were for fear of the temple authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Having said this, the Savior showed them the marks of crucifixion. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw Jesus who said to them again, peace be with you. As Abba God sent me, so I'm sending you. After saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like a rush of violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and the tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Then Peter explained to the people what had just happened, quoting the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your children shall prophesy and your young ones shall see visions and your old shall dream dreams. Even upon the captives of all genders in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God spoken for us. The word of God lived among us. Thanks be to God. Just beyond that frantic pace, 
our restless feet have trod lie deep still pools of quietness the dwelling place of God meet me in the stillness Lord Then Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, which descended like tongues of fire. And in those days, it is declared, God will pour out God's spirit upon all people and we shall prophesy. And our old will see visions and our young will dream dreams. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, will oh God, be found acceptable. A rock, our redeemer. It's in the matchless name of Jesus, our liberator, we pray. Amen. In moments of anxiety or anger, I get an alert from my Apple Watch. Breathe. The haptic mechanism vibrates 
causing me to raise my left hand and look down. And on the highly sophisticated liquid retina watch face screen is one word set against a calming blue background. Breathe. I appreciate this modern technology that calls me back to that basic primordial instinct. You see, although we automatically know how to breathe at birth, over time, we somehow forget to breathe regularly, normally, at all times. While the cry is the sign of life at a baby's birth that we are trained to listen for in order to know that a newborn is alive, the cry is actually a signifier that points to the inhale that must precede that first audible exhale. Yes, breath is that first act that defines that we are alive. Sometimes this haptic vibration reminder from my watch calls me to be still and bring my attention to breath. Sometimes this reminder is caused by something trivial or relatively insignificant Perhaps it's the excitement of my favorite song playing on the radio that raises my heart rate, or maybe it's a commercial about that most delicious snack in the world, my favorite Haribo gummy bears. Or maybe it's some of the annoying fireworks that accompany life as a city slicker that startles me, creates a sense of momentary panic and raises my heartbeat. More often than not, the reminder to breathe is triggered by something that I've read in the Boston Globe or watched on MSNBC that causes anger to well up inside of me. Maybe like it was this week, it was the Senate Republicans filibustering against the For the People Act that would improve voting access when state legislators are continuing to tout Trump's big lie in an attempt to systematically disenfranchise people of color and working class folk, all just days after that same Senate voted to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. And while I'm quite pleased that this is nationally recognized, although I personally have celebrated Juneteenth as the real Independence Day for as long as I can remember, I cannot help but to acknowledge, right, the sinister irony of symbolic acts that ration out a few feel-good gifts of charity but still fail to enact systemic change. Not to mention this is all the while there is a relentless assault against critical race theory that would actually teach us why Juneteenth is actually a thing that tells us that yes, race is a social construction, which means it does not have to be this way where black skin equals an assault by white supremacy and white privilege that renders the experience of many black folks less than that which is accessible to most white folks. So even though right, race is a social construction, it has very real implications on the lived experience of people of color, in fact, of all people. So sometimes when I think about these things, I get angry and my Apple Watch must remind me to breathe as it did as we awaited the sentencing verdict of Derek Chauvin. And while on the one hand, I'm encouraged by the global movement for Black lives that has altered the course of history, yes, we all waited with bated breath to know the legal value placed on George Floyd's breath. And while on the one hand, Chauvin's conviction is a step forward 
on the other hand, 22 and a half years is still not enough. He got off way too easily, in my opinion. And so has our society because George Floyd was murdered by the state and Breonna Taylor was murdered by the state, its representatives. So how easy it is to simply reduce this crime, these crimes to one single individually when in fact what we are talking about is an entire system of oppression. So before I, I know it, I'm so angry that my failure to breathe rhythmically as I was instinctually born to do that I, I grow so angry that this failure to breathe rhythmically was beginning, right, to cause a physical, chemical alteration in my body. And the sensors on my watch detected that my failure to breathe regularly, rhythmically, was starving my body of oxygen and the rising levels of carbon dioxide in my blood was literally poisoning me, causing an elevated heart rate because my heart was overworking and beating too fast. It's an early warning sign that if the heart rate remains elevated for too long, then I would be at risk for cardiac arrest, leading cause of death in the United States, particularly for black men. But this reminder to breathe, this call to breath, it literally is an invitation to mend our broken hearts and to give our hearts a rest to slow down and begin to heal. For it is written, then Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. This reminder to breathe it's an invitation to take a moment, literally pause a beat, to breathe and meditate and to allow our bodies to return to a healthier, safer place. Because if we don't breathe, then we don't live. And if we don't live, then we can't love. And if we don't love, then we are not free. And if we are not free, then we're basically already dead. To be still, even in this moment, and bring your attention to your breath. Let us reimagine the gift of love and life that comes with breath. And yes, the freedom that it brings. Because in the beginning, there was breath. So this day, be mindful. And each day, be mindful of your breath. And remember that with every breath you take, remember that every day is sacred and that you are a gift. And every fiber of your being and every cell in your body and every molecule of your soul is a divine gift of that still creating, always loving God. And remember that when we were fashioned in God's image and God breathed the breath of life into us, it was an act of love that loves us into freedom. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I need you to hear me today that with every breath, we participate in the creative life of the divine that dwells within us, within you every single one of you under the sound of my voice. And in your breath is the dwelling place of God. The songwriter is correct. And I could listen to that song day in and day out. And sometimes I do. The gentle pull of God is often lost amidst the rush of all the obligations which lay a claim on us yet 
Just beyond the frantic pace our restless feet have trod, like deep still pools of quietness, the dwelling place of God. Meet me in the stillness, Lord, be the air I breathe. Meet me in the stillness, Lord, free me to receive. <laughs> the dwelling place of God is within us. And there's something inside of us that is part of us, that is more than us. And it's the power of the living God working within us. So beloved, receive this gift, receive God's Holy Spirit and reclaim who you are. Reclaim your birthright and reclaim your breath. On this day. So take a deep breath. Because God's love for us runs deep within us and you are beloved. And you beloved, you are love incarnate and the spirit of God is among us and within us and hovering over the good work that God still has for us. The work that God has in store for us. This is the year of inspiration at Union. And as we pause at the midway mark of this year, we reclaim and reimagine this year of inspiration, knowing that inspire means to draw in, to take in, to welcome in, to inhale. Inspire means to in-breathe, to breathe in. Biblically speaking, inspiration is related to breath and spirit. The biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek, ruach and pneuma, they're interwoven, interrelated for wind and air and breath and spirit. So then to inspire, is to breathe in the very breath of God that has been breathed into us in creation and is given to each and every one of us at birth. So during this year, 2021, this year of inspiration, we are breathing and we are catching our breath and we are inhaling God's breath-giving grace in ways that we've never seen before. And we are inspiring so that we might be an inspiration. Here we are at the midpoint of this year, even as the world reopens, we acknowledge that the first half of this year, 2021, has still been so hard. After a devastatingly hard 2020, a year that quite literally took our breath away as we confronted the coronavirus pandemic and we confronted the pandemic of anti-Black racism that led to the suffocating death, the murder of George Floyd and, and, and anti-Brown violence and anti-Asian violence and anti-trans violence. It was a year, a hard year, where we began, perhaps, to confront. And even as the difficulties of 2020 and the first half of this year begin to fade away, perhaps, and the ability to visit with friends and, and, and hug family members quite literally has been a breath of fresh air. And as we reach the midpoint of this year and stand on the edge of so much possibility, full of so much hope, as we travel again and prepare to worship in the South End building again, as we advance to the new normal, this message is an invitation. Yes, it is an invitation, beloved, to simple things, to our breath that we might release the weights and the worries and we might be freed to receive. You see, here we are between Juneteenth and the 4th of July, Independence Day at the end of Pride Month, when we are still 
learning how to really get free, to get free in our bodies and our beauties and our belovedness. So it seems to me that, that, that as we are still trying to get free in our bodies, in our beauty, in our belovedness, we must turn our attention to the beauty of the belovedness of our bodies that is given to us in that first breath of life. As we are created in the very image of the God who loves us into freedom. So when we breathe, we are invited to be freed, to receive the lavish love, the reckless love that is poured out abundantly upon all people in those days, it is promised, that I will pour out my spirit on all people and your old will see visions and your young will dream dreams. So when I title this sermon, Reimagining This Year of Inspiration, I'm just offering to us a simple reminder, just like the one my watch gives to me, catch our breath and be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we might yet run the race that is before us. And then Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit which descended as like tongues of fire. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and you shall prophesy. The, the, the resurrected Christ meets us at Pentecost when he invites us to receive that which is being poured out. And beloved, we are invited in this moment at union to receive and to experience those visions and those dreams and to lean into the visionary work of spirit that is happening in our midst. As I close, I, I just want to call our attention to that which is happening, that visionary work of spirit that is happening in our midst as we are reimagining together our space and transforming this space, these spaces, these physical locations on a map into something more than mere materiality. We are transporting, transforming them and we are creating out of physical space. We are creating places of meaning, places of belonging with which anthropologists Jacqueline Nassie Brown helps us to see in her wonderful text, Dropping Anchor, Setting Sail, that these places of belonging are more than physical places on a map that the eyes can see. So as we make our midway point in this year of inspiration. I am delighted, beloved, that we are in the process right now of transforming the physical parsonage located in Roxbury to what we have named as the Hilda Evans House. I'm grateful to Robert for the suggestion for this name that honors one of the ancestors in our community. I'm grateful to Reverend Charlene Zuhl and, and Cynthia Perry, who will become our house coordinator. We name our parsonage as we transform that space into a place of belonging. Inspired by Hilda Evans. On this past Thursday at the Seniors Lunch Club, we discussed Mother Hilda and, and what was going on at Union in those latter days of the 1990s when we were wrestling about our place in a community in the South End and, and what it meant for us to simply be good neighbors. And Hilda Evans, Mother Evans said that we need to open the doors and we need to look around and go out into the community in which we have been planted and we might welcome in those who are among us. Mother Hilda, even though I did not know her personally, I, I've come to know her in spirit as she has inspired us 
reminded us that being a good neighbor is not that hard, actually. It's pretty simple. Like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. It's not that hard. It's actually pretty simple to be a good neighbor. It's as simple as breathing. So now, beloved, we are in the midst of converting our five-bedroom Victorian home previously used for pastors. We are converting it into an intentional community for Black and Brown seminarians, students at Boston University School of Theology. Right, since Robert and I don't need a five-bedroom home right now, this move is about good stewardship of space, yes, but it is more than that. It's about being good neighbors to students, some of whom are coming to the U.S. for the first time. So we are envisioning the Hilda Evans house as a place of belonging. On the same day this past Thursday that I was with the seniors as we recounted the legacy and inspiration of Mother Hilda, we were also conducting Cynthia, Reverend Kyle, and Reverend Charlene and I, we were conducting interviews for our first cohort of students at the Hilda Evans House. And what we heard time and again in these interviews is that there was a longing for some of the applicants to experience a place of rest where they did not have to endure the exhausting microaggressions of dominant white supremacist culture, a longing to have a place where the stress that is too often worn in our bodies every time we walk out the door and causes our heart rate to soar. They desired a place that they could truly call home. So that's what we're creating. And we're also creating beloved and in a few moments just following the offering we will debut our renovation video as we transform, as we look forward to coming back into the Union Church building in the South End, that it would be a transform place that is fully accessible to all people, all members of our immediate community and those in the wider community, that it might be accessible to those of different physical abilities. It's a glorious thing to see this gift of space become more of a place of rest, of welcome, of hospitality, indeed a sanctuary. And then finally, beloved, I'm just so delighted by the work of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization Union Core Team. Grateful to Reverend Kyle for his coordination from the pastoral standpoint and, and particularly for uh, Scott Lewis and Ann Gross and the many others on the core team that have allowed our congregation to be part of the refounding process of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization that we helped found 30 years ago. As we re imagine Boston, right? As the listening sessions have revealed and the tale of two cities of Boston where income inequality is so stark that the economic net worth of a white Bostonian is a quarter million dollars, $250,000 while a black Bostonian's economic net worth according to the Color of Wealth report is just $8 virtually nothing. So GBIO is, 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 is looking squarely at economic opportunity and how we might close this wealth gap and the inequities that make affordable housing not really affordable for many working class people. And we've named issues of homelessness and substance use disorder and Reentry and immigration, racial justice, and climate environmental justice as the work to which we are called. This is the work, the work of reimagining. 
more than just sprucing up material, physical places. This work of renovation, of reimagining a city and a space is really about cultivating places of belonging where we all have opportunity to thrive. So yes, beloved, we are doing the work of enacting Union's vision to be spiritual home as we fulfill Union's mission to nurture followers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So then Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit which descended as tongues of fire. And in those days, after this, will pour out my spirit upon all people, upon all flesh, upon all bodies, you shall prophesy after this, and your old shall see visions. And your young will dream dreams. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And Jesus said to them, Jesus says to us, receive the Holy Spirit. So if your prayer today has been as mine, free me to receive, just take a breath, inhale and exhale and know that here at Union, you are free to receive, free to receive love, free to receive joy, free to receive peace, indeed, the very breath of God. Know that you belong here at Union, and we want to journey with you on this thing called faith. So if you feel inspired, if you feel joy and peace and love in this space, I invite you to reach out to our ministerial team at unionboston.org slash join and take the first step in walking with us so we can walk with you in faith. Indeed, the doors of the church are open. Yes, beloved. This is uh, Reverend Kyle again, and now it's time for the offering. Yes, you need. It's time for the offering. You know, this is the time of the service where we all get to participate in a in a particular way, which is giving of our tithes and offerings. There are many ways that we can give to the church of our prayers, presence, service, and witness. And yes, even giving of our money is a way to support the ministries of this church because we continue to grow, and we're preparing for more and more transformational things for our community, for Boston and beyond. So. If you feel so led, uh, there are three ways to give this morning. First, you can go to Union Boston, unionboston.org slash give or go to the Union Church app and you can give there online. Second, you could text to give, just text a dollar amount to 84321 and follow the instructions there. Or you can mail a check to Union, Church, Union United Methodist Church at 485 Columbus Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02118. Yes, beloved, now is time for the offering. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah.
the beloved uh, uh, Reverend Kyle, go ahead and spotlight yourself as well. Um, I am geeked. I'm just geeked today uh, that we've got, as I mentioned in the sermon, uh, we've got this renovation update uh, video. It's our penultimate, our second to last renovation video. Uh, once the work completes uh, in some weeks, a few weeks, uh, we'll have a summary that looks at the whole picture. Uh, but I'm grateful. I want to spotlight Reverend Kyle because he put the video together uh, with my iPhone uh, recordings. Um, so let's take a look at what's happening at 485 Columbus Avenue in the south end of Boston. So I'm standing now in a lobby outside of the chapel in our main office, which is part of our renovation is going to be completely redone. You'll enter into the church at street level. You'll be able to take a set of stairs or an elevator lift up to this, the sanctuary level or down to the basement level towards Cooper Hall and our classrooms. So for weekday gatherings and Sunday 8 a.m. worship, we will enter Union through our West Newton Street entrance. Uh, you see on the left there, uh, this whole area will be covered under a fire alert system, the panels being installed. You see the vaulted ceilings. There's the elevator lift, which is still being installed. You can go up three stairs to the chapel and sanctuary level. There's the entrance to the chapel. You also see the vaulted ceilings, the original ceilings there. We've expanded the hallway. Now inside of our beautiful chapel at Union Church. And as part of our renovation, we have the opportunity to make our worship space even more versatile and more dynamic. The plan as part of this renovation is to replace our static pews with movable chairs which will allow us to live into what's known as church in the round. And we're going to place at the center of our worship space our baptismal font, the communion table, and the preaching of the word. Here's a look at the chapel as the pews have been removed, the carpet as well, the elevated area taken out to make space for multi-purpose, various orientations, of using this space for worship and for gatherings. Take a look at the entrance here. What a before and after. It's pretty incredible what these uh, craftsmen have done. It's like a brand new space. There's the elevator lift at the chapel area. The drop ceilings are gone. You get the original architecture, the high vaulted ceilings. This is entering the main office from the hallway before and after. The color scheme is a grayish wall, black doors with white trim. A lot more open, welcoming those doors were original, repurposed. So let's head downstairs, a set of stairs there, and of course you can take the new lift down. There's the hallway to Cooper Hall through that door. There will be eventually in our next phase four accessible restrooms and a shower in this area. Not able to do it at this part of the work. We have some more fundraising to do. 
You'll also see in this room, which will be a conference room, how much water infiltration we had coming in behind the drywall uh, in the original foundation. So we're working on a full roof replacement, hopefully to begin later in the summer to be completed by the winter to shore up our building. There's the pump as the sewage and water lines from West Newton side had collapsed. So we've got a pump that's going from this side of the church to the West Rutland side, which saved us a couple hundred thousand dollars. And here is one of the scariest parts of the church, the original electrical panel, knob and tube from the 19th century, 200 amps, which we were still using, but a super fire hazard. That's the before, here is the after. All the electrical wiring on this side of the church is brand new and safer to preserve our 150 year old building. So there it is Union, we're on our way. Listen, listen, uh, uh, tech team, go ahead and unmute everybody. I need y'all to make some noise today <laughs> because this is just bananas. Um, uh, just crazy. Woohoo! Yeah! Yes, it's Woo wonderful. <laughs> yeah, woohoo! What's your microphone? All right. All right. All right. Absolutely yes. gorgeous. All right. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Great job. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I lived in a parsonage like that Great once. Job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, Come on, man. Man. Electricity. What a gift. <laughs> yes. I thought so, somebody, uh, uh, you can go ahead and, uh, and, yeah, and mute are. again. Um, uh, somebody, uh, chat, uh, I think uh, Troy, <laughs> electrifying. <laughs> like, right. Like, no pun intended. Literally, the electricians, like master electricians, looked at that and were like, uh, they didn't want to touch it and like get in there because, yeah, um, it's been said number, uh, numerous times that the only reason why a union is still standing um, is because it's a house of God um, and that there have been decades of deferred maintenance uh, that we are just literally like decades. Um, uh, existing conditions uh, going that should have been addressed in the early 1920s, 30s. We bought the building in 1949, or the conference bought it for us uh, during the migration of Black Boston um, as, as the white church that built it, Union Congregational Church, uh, uh, moved out of the South End. It was purchased for us, but in many ways had been worn out. Um, uh, and now, uh, 80 years later, we're doing, uh, some of the first improvements, um, that weren't on an immediate emergency basis and have discovered, of course, as you saw in the, the water conditions, there were things that were hidden behind the walls. Of course, you always find things when you take down walls, but like some of the conditions were just, uh, even more frightening than we had imagined. This is all to say. Um, as we come to the close of this service, uh, that God is not done with union yet. Uh, we are, amen. Uh, amen. We are transforming uh, physical space into uh, places of belonging uh, that will uh, live on for generations to come. So we're grateful and thankful um, uh, for this good work and uh, keep praying. Uh, we've got work to do uh, still. Um, uh, we'll be down there all week. Uh, checking things out, making decisions. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, sometime this summer, uh, hopefully things will be drawn to a close, which would then pave the way for our re-entry. You saw in the last in the electrical closet, uh, there was this box with a plug at the very end. Uh, that was the preparations for the internet upgrade. Uh, that is a, a huge consideration for our re-entry. We made a commitment 
uh, that we won't re-enter the building uh, until we can continue to hold space for our digital community. Uh, those who are uh, not yet vaccinated, those who are outside of the city of Boston. Um, so you can read more. Thank you, Reverend Kyle. Uh, the re-entry update. Uh, we're going to keep working. We're going to keep uh, making things ready, but things are actually with the internet upgrade that should be completed uh, if all is, remains on schedule by the end of July. Uh, we thought we were thinking in Oct August or September, uh, but things are moving quick, more quickly. So keep the prayer world turning. Um, stay tuned. We're going to be coming back asking for money <laughs> in the next couple of weeks because we got a lot of technology upgrades uh, in order to live stream our service that we need you to support uh, in order to execute this hybrid uh, worship uh, service um, online and in person. Go to unionboston.org forward slash summer for events that are happening. Uh, we, we thank Aaron. Uh, Wagner for hosting our first uh, online paint night, as well as Reverend Ashley uh, for a happy hour, more activities to come. Also uh, our spiritual uh, recharge opportunities on Wednesdays, prayer call at seven, meditation at noon and 6 p.m. Uh, Bible study. Beloved, if all hearts and minds are on one accord, we sing our closing hymn, if when nothing else could help, when nothing else could help, love, it lifts us. Let's make this our closing praise.
I see the chat, uh, see uh, Nina and the way in which love uh, has surrounded you in this moment as we continue to uh, give thanks for the life and legacy of Mother Elderkin. And we will uh, continue to hold you and uh, family in prayers during this time of transition as we keep singing this song that love that surrounds us and it holds us it inspires us and it lifts us so no matter what you're going through beloved no matter the weight of the world pains and trials and tribulations i invite you this day to pause and take a deep breath and inhale the good gift of God and be free to receive the lavish love of God that lifts us. And now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen, beloved. Uh, uh, Todd, you can go ahead and unmute the lines and uh, you are able to greet one another, beloved. God bless everyone. Have a good week. Have a good week.